Hi guys, it's Graham Old here from howtoinductions.com and I want to talk to you briefly about the early learning set. Now I, I nearly said the early learning set induction, but one of the points I'm going to make, or one of the points that Ericsson makes, is that this is more than an induction, this is a, a process, he refers to it as the early learning set process. Um, similar to how you might talk about the yes set as a process. And also, I should, I should also correct myself that many of us refer to this as Ericsson's early learning set. Um, that's certainly how hypnotists will, will be aware of it. But I'm, I'm fairly certain any intrepid researcher would be able to find an early learning set in use before Ericsson. Just think of any therapeutic modality that made use of uh, regression or calling upon earlier experiences, earlier positive experiences that now give you resources you can use and, and you've got an early learning set. But the difference may be that Ericsson was the one who explicitly, at least to his students, explicitly referred to it as a trance process. So, so that's um, the early learning set that we're going to be looking at. It is very useful as a induction process and that's how we're going to look at it initially but I also want to look at how how it can be used therapeutically as a tool um, anyone who's familiar with my work um, hopefully would know that I don't see the inductions as something we do just to get someone into hypnosis an induction is itself a therapeutic process so after having looked at the early learning set and Ericsson's example of it um, we're then going to look at how the early learning set can be used therapeutically. And I think we'll probably finish by looking at how you can use the early learning set in, uh, I guess, non-Ericksonian ways. So along the way, I'll add in some of my own kind of hints and tips and possibly pitfalls to look out for. Um, but let's start by looking at how Ericsson describes it. This is taken from his book, Hypnotic Realities. I'm just going to read it straight from from the screen, uh, just so you see so here from the horse's mouth, as it were. So Erickson starts by having this student, she's a psychologist who wants to learn hypnosis, and Erickson has the idea of teaching her hypnosis by hypnotizing her. Um, many great teachers of hypnosis nowadays um, use a similar sort of method. Uh, but Erickson has her, has her start by looking at a corner of a picture frame, and to us modern hypnotists, we may think, oh, we know what's happening here. This is going to be an eye fixation induction. And it, I guess it is. It starts with an element of that. But Erickson uses it in a completely different way. He uses the eye fixation not so much to create eye fatigue as to simply create a state of focus, which often carries with it a natural openness. So this is the early learning set taken from Hypnotic Realities, a transcript from Erickson's own words. I'll avoid doing the Ericsson voice. Um, it's far too much of an easy accent to pull off, so there's no point doing that. So Ericsson begins, look at the far upper corner of that picture. The far upper corner of that picture. Now I'm going to talk to you. When you first went to kindergarten, grade school, this matter of learning letters and numerals seemed to be a big insurmountable task. To recognise the letter A, to tell a Q from an O, was very, very difficult. And then to script and print were so different. But you learned to form a mental image of some kind. You didn't know it at the time, but it was a permanent mental image. And later on, in grammar school, you formed other mental images of words or pictures and sentences. You developed more and more mental images without knowing you were developing mental images. And you can recall all those images. Now you can go anywhere you wish and transport yourself to any situation. You can feel water. You may want to swim in it. You can do anything you want. You 
You don't even have to listen to my voice because your unconscious will hear it. Your unconscious can try anything it wishes, but your conscious mind isn't going to do anything of importance. And in the transcript at that point, Erickson invites her to notice that her eyelids are fluttering. She's altered her breathing. She's altered her pulse. She's altered her blood pressure. Um, if you read my book on mastering the leisure induction, I talk about the purpose of feedback and I learned this uh, valuable um, technique from Stephen Brooks. The hypnotist observes how the client is responding and then utilizes that to enhance the response. So by saying you have noticed this or that, you're encouraging the client to themselves notice it, which tends to make them go further inside to increase the response. But you're also encouraging them that they are responding correctly. I don't know if you're anything like me, but if you're working with a client particularly um, for the first time, no matter what you say in your pre-talk, they may have thoughts in their head about, am I doing what I'm meant to be doing? Am I doing this correctly? And just, just by saying, as Ericsson would say, yes, that's right, all this kind of stuff. Um, but also letting them know, and you're blinking, which is something people commonly do as they begin to go into hypnosis. You're affirming to your client that everything is good. Everything is as, as expected. They're responding in the appropriate way. So you observe your clients, um, what we call minimal cues, and you utilize them by feeding them back. Ericsson continues. There's nothing really important except the activity of your unconscious mind. And that can be whatever your unconscious mind desires. Now physical comfort exists, but you don't even need to pay attention to your relaxation and comfort. I can tell your unconscious mind that you are an excellent hypnotic subject. And whenever you need to or want to, your unconscious mind will allow you to use it. And it can take time, its own time, letting you go into trance, helping you to understand anything reasonable. Now, I want to pause briefly at this point and pick up on something, because I read recently some example scripts of the early learning set, and they all began either by having a client close their eyes or by maybe beginning with the early, with the eye fixation and aiming for eye closure because as hypnotists, we're often more comfortable when the client's eyes are closed. I don't know whether it's because the focus is off of us or because we've convinced ourselves, or it must have been hypnosis, now their eyes are closed. But Erickson doesn't do that. And nowhere in this process does he say, and your eyes getting tired, and you can now close your eyes. He starts with an eye fixation, but it's not employed as an obvious or explicit means of eye fatigue. It focuses the client's attention, and then you'll notice he talks about a number of mental images. You have permanent mental images. You can recall those mental images. So he, he's causing eye fatigue, or is inviting the client to experience eye fatigue by focusing. Then he's inviting them to look inside to think about all these mental images they have. So eye closure would be a natural result, but it's not necessary. If it didn't occur, it wouldn't affect the process one little bit. You might notice that we could call this a typically Ericksonian indirect approach. I mean, it's taken from the book Hypnotic Realities when the subtitle is The Induction of Clinical Hypnosis and Forms of Indirect Suggestion. Um, but you might also have noticed that there are times, even in this framework, where Erickson has um, been very direct. For example, th this bit fascinates me. Now, you can go anywhere you wish and transport yourself to any situation. 
So that's 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 cheeky for a start. They they may not have been thinking of going anywhere else. But not only has Ericsson said, you can, if your mind wanders, go anywhere you wish. But he's reinforced it by saying, and transport yourself to any situation. It's almost like he's readying the client to move on to somewhere else. He then says, you can feel water. You may want to swim in it. You can do anything you want. There's, there's so much in that. Um, you can go anywhere you wish. Well, that's that's very permissive. That's very typically Ericksonian. She may not have thought about going somewhere else, but she is now. And then you can feel water. You may want to swim in it. Where on earth did that come from? I'd, I'd love it. Um, my hunch is that Erickson knows this client. As I said, they were a psychologist wishing to learn hypnosis from him. Um, maybe he's talked to them a little bit about their upbringing, you know, before the session began. He may just be taking a gamble that typically American children at that age, perhaps in that part of the country, would have gone through these stages. You learn your alphabet, you learn to write script, you learn to swim. I mean, it could be she was looking at a picture. The picture that she was looking at was of some sort of seascape or a swimming pool. We don't know. But um, yeah, Ericsson there is being very indirectly direct. But I love the fact that he doesn't say picture water because she's already picturing things. She's already got all these mental images. He says you can feel water. I mean, he adds this, this lovely line. You may want to swim in it, which makes which makes the whole thing experiential. She's not now picturing a swimming pool or a beach scene. She's feeling water and she may even be swimming in it. She may experience that and and all that that brings back for her as a young child learning to swim. And then as if to give himself the ultimate safety net, he brings in the perfect Ericsonian line, you can do anything you want. So this effectively gives permission back to the client. Just in case they'd been transporting themselves to a beautiful garden and had heard the mention of water and they were thinking, what are you talking about? Ericsson covers all the bases and says, you know, but it's up to you. That you can do anything you want. So that, that's, that's the gist of like an early learning set induction. An early learning set process, excuse me. So Ericsson will talk about something you've learnt. Um, he'll talk about it in a multi-sensory way. He'll talk about a number of things you've learnt. And in his own way, he's inviting the client to go inside and relive that and re-experience that. My, my writing on the leisure induction really is just um, ripping this off. I'm just talking about an earlier experience someone's has that they enjoyed. Whereas Ericsson is talking specifically about an early experience someone has had that's been positive where they've learned something. So I'd now like to look at the early learning set as a resource tool. So Ericsson was uh, using the early learning set to demonstrate or help on experience hypnosis. But if he'd wanted to use it in a more thoroughly therapeutic way, he could have easily um, expanded on the description of learning something, maybe along with a discussion of the full starts and stumbles we all experience, and the eventual satisfaction, the achievement of learning something new that comes from that. And we could then move on later, um, you know, from the example of learning the alphabet, we could talk about learning to ride a bike or learning to drive or whatever achievements your clients have had that you may know of. You can really zoom in on the curiosity, the desire, the openness, the readiness to learn that your client has previously experienced. Because here's my, here's my hunch. And I could be way off here and I haven't got the research to back this up. I'm using terms very loosely here. My suspicion is that any time we learn something, we are in a trance state. And you can, uh, we can quibble over my choice of words there, but as I said, I'm using them very loosely and experientially. But when we learn something in a positive way, 
there's openness, there's curiosity, there's satisfaction, there's reward. Now, how explicit we make all that is, is completely up, up to you and your client and the process you have going on. Because really what you want to do is you want to take those early, that earlier trance experience, that positive learning experience, and you want to anchor it in. And you want to bring that into the, if you like, the problem state or the difficult situation that the client currently finds himself in. And like I say, how explicit you want to be with that depends on your approach. If you look at the work of someone like Rob McNeely, um, we're not necessarily talking about anchoring in an NLP way, but that's, that's certainly possible. Instead, we're allowing someone to access the previous experiences of learning and inviting them to carry over that experience and that process and success to an area of their life where it might prove useful. I'll include a link to Rob McNeely's channel underneath this video because it's it's criminal. It's not more well known, um, particularly here in the UK. It may, it may be where you are. I mean, just some things to troubleshoot to be aware of. You might want to, if you're going to talk about a learning set in the way that Ericsson did with an alphabet and you know chronologically advance from that. You may want to be aware if your client enjoyed school. Um, you might want to know if they're dyslexic. Can they swim? Can they ride a bike? Obviously, don't take these things for granted. Because we're also, we're not just talking about um, things the client has learnt. Because we can also all learn things in difficult ways. We can all learn things and it's a negative experience. We're talking about things your client has learned when it was a positive eye-opening, mind-altering, life-changing experience, when it was um, a resourceful trance state we can call upon. And also a useful thing that you see Ericsson do a little bit there, and if you go back and, and listen to, to what I read out or, or find the section in Hypnotic Realities, there's a lot of um, indirect language Ericsson uses, and I think NLPers will love some of it. They'll, they'll grab on that and go, "Oh, he's you know he's saying this. You might want to do that. You know, you don't need to focus on your relaxation with this sort of stuff." But one thing Ericsson does is there's there's a use of rapport. He acknowledges how hard it can be to learn something because if someone's coming to us and they're saying. I'm sitting my driving test for the eighth time. I just, I can't do it. I can't, I just can't get my head in the right space. I just cannot conquer this thing. We then don't want to start by saying, well, remember when you learned the alphabet, that was easy. Remember when you learned to walk, that was easy. Because we're kind of implying, what's your problem? Learning things is easy. No, we start by going, yeah, often anything of any value you learn is difficult. You'll fall down more often than, or not more often than you'll get up, but you'll fall down each time you're learning to walk. And in fact, you can't learn to walk without falling down. Uh, so yeah, there's an acknowledgement of how hard it can be to learn something, yet that doesn't mean it might not be a rewarding experience. That doesn't mean it's not worth progressing with, because precisely because you've overcome these difficult experiences in the past, because you've overcome troubling and challenging learning experiences and found them to be rewarding, you can do this again. You have this within you. This is something you can call upon. So you can talk about an early learning set in a very direct way. You don't have to be quite so Eric Sodian about it. You can have someone in, have them sit down, close your eyes, think about when you learned to write the alphabet. Um, yeah, you don't have to be quite so clever with, you know, you have mental images, you can recall those mental images. I, I think there's great power in that. I think you're giving autonomy back to the client and you're saying you have this within you. So when you face this situation again, you've got this. But you can be direct about it if you want. There's no reason this has to look 
Ericksonian. If you are being direct, you may want to evoke their early learning strategies. This goes back to me saying that a positive or successful learning experience is a trance state. So what do they do? What headspace, if you like, are they in when they're learning something positively? And often that's openness, curiosity, focus. They're very, um, I think, indisputable aspects of positive learning experiences. So you, you don't even necessarily need to hone in on the early learning experience as much as their early learning strategies. What were the tools they used? And you bring them out of that experience into their current situation. Um, one way I often use an early learning set, possibly more often than not, is I will have someone begin uh, recalling being at school, one of the early lessons at school. And someone may not be able to get a specific lesson, like can you remember learning to write the alphabet or learning your letters, but they can probably picture their classroom. So I'll have them, you know, revisit their classroom and imagine it's a day when they're learning their letters or their learning script, they're learning to write, joined up, whatever it might be. I have them go back there and I have them, I, I, I try to describe it in as much detail as possible or, or at least have them recall it in as much detail as possible, what it may have felt like to hold that pencil, who they may or may not have been sat next to. I wonder if they can picture what the walls in the classroom looked like. And then I'll begin, and I'm using this almost in a pre-talk way, I'll begin talking about hypnosis. And I'll say that hypnosis is sometimes referred to like sleep, but I think of it as more like a daydream. And can you remember being at school and your mind just began to wander? Maybe you were looking out the window. Maybe your mind's a million miles away. And the teacher may be calling you, Graham, 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 but you're just not there. Your mind is elsewhere. On other occasions, you might be daydreaming and you hear a pin drop. It's different for different people on different days. And if I've sensed that they are responding positively to the, your mind being a million miles away, a description of a daydream, I might then say, and I wonder if your mind can imagine as you're in that classroom, the job you wanted to do when you were older. And obviously here I'm calling upon things we would have discussed in, in the intake. But I might say and how you saw yourself driving with your children and your partner at the weekends, relaxing, just going out for a drive. Noticing how easily and smoothly that comes to you. How natural that feels. That this is something you simply do. And it's more than something you do. This is in some ways a part of who you are. This is the future, even without realising it that your daydreaming mind back there, right here and now, chose for yourself. And I find that a, a quite useful approach to take. And obviously you can veer off in any number of directions there. And I may um, get quite detailed in what they're daydreaming about. Um, I think the time I most used it recently, uh, this is why I use the driving example, they pulled up outside their house, they went inside their house. Um, th we discussed what their house looked like. They went for another drive and it was no big deal. You know, they, they realized they needed milk in the fridge or something. And so they got back in their car and they went for a drive. I talked about all the things they'd learned when they were learning to drive that they hadn't even realized they were learning. The way they pay attention the way they are a considerate driver, the way that 
their safety, their children's safety, the safety of passengers and fellow drivers is of paramount importance and how that all just comes easily. But you can talk about all sorts of things. You might talk about, so reverse back from a daydream and they're back in the classroom. We can talk about learning. We can talk about growth. You can talk about friendship as they're learning. They're writing the A, they're joining it to the B. They're discovering some of those letters that feel like they are difficult to attach to another one. Like how the C and the D are going to get attached and the F and the G. The learning joined up handwriting like that feels like almost insurmountable and yet somehow you may not even know how you did it but along the way you picked that up you made those connections and those friends of yours in the class maybe the person sat next to you maybe someone a few rows back to the left or to the right you made those connections and you enjoyed that sense of belonging acceptance of yourself, of someone else, of someone else accepting you. And you can remember how that feels. So there's all sorts of ways you can um, use early learning. Say so it doesn't just have to be as an induction. It can flow effortlessly into a therapeutic process. Um, I use it in some ways. I think if you were a solution focused brief therapist, and I think you saw me use the early learning set, you would notice that I'm, I'm using it in a miracle question kind of way. Combining it with a daydream, I'm having someone think about their future when the problems are no longer an issue. And I'm just wondering, I'm just curious about what they've learned. Those things they now know without even knowing they know them and how naturally that came to them. Even as natural as going to sleep, having a dream where your unconscious maybe unpacks something for you, reveals a lesson, and you wake up knowing what you now know. So that's the early learning set. There's so much that can be done with that. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you use it. And I really hope you feedback and let me know how you get on with it. Thank you.